eyes. So, okay, so first questions um, to the panel, and in any order, so I'd actually just ask some. The first question is, what will this industry look like, do you think, in, say, five to 10 years' time? Maybe I'm earing maybe towards the 10, because five is very, very soon. But let's say five to 10 years' time. What do you think this industry is really going to look like? Not what it could look like, but what it will look like. And I'm, I guess I'm focusing on, on Europe, primarily here, and to some extent, Ireland. Whoever, yeah. I'll, I'll throw the ball yeah. in. Um, I believe we're on a transition away from an old uh, model, uh, predominantly based on fossil fuel generation and passive customers, to something very, very different. And we've heard lots of where that's heading this morning and this afternoon. Um, the future will be very much uh, carbon-free, customer-centric. Um, but in 10 years' time, uh, we'll be well on the way that transition. We'll still have large fossil fuel burning uh, power stations coexisting with new technologies on that transition. It's a law of physics that you need inertia, it's called in engineering terms, to facilitate a lot of these new technologies. So we'll, we, we will still have that. I don't believe by then uh, that problem will be cracked by new technologies. So we'd be well on the way. Uh, lots more renewables. And um, from Michael Liebrich's presentation this morning, I expect that onshore wind will not require a subsidy, and maybe some of the others uh, won't require a subsidy. There'll be new technologies maybe that we can't even dream of today will be being subsidized. Increasing levels of distributed generation and storage, beginning to put the customer into this prosumer space where they're producing and consuming electricity. Customer right at the heart of it, smart, engaged, internet of things, new players, new business models, and um, lots of tariff innovation by suppliers um, dealing with this technology and a new customer-centric business model, uh, and the whole smart, smart metering, smart networks, all colliding with the internet of things. I would, I would say that uh, I'm not sure Amory Lovins would agree with you that in 10 years' time, we still need big fossil fuel power plants. But what one thing in his message that I thought was, was very important and is under, actually underemphasized in his message is that if we can make things work with a portfolio of clean resources, the key word is portfolio, and that's wind farms and fuel cells and energy storage and distributed solar and central solar, we still are going to need the grid. So this is a, a constant that I don't think we emphasize quite enough today, that, that the grid is a, is a key to making the vision work. Regardless of the mix, it is going to be a mix. The optimization problem is, uh, is improved when we have options. It doesn't mean we see analysis of how could it work if a customer just had solar and storage? Could he go off grid? Sure, he could go off grid, but it's not the optimum solution. The optimum solution is having other clean sources and, and optimizing on that base. And, and so our problem, one of our biggest problems is figuring out how to pay for the grid, which actually is a much more complicated grid now because we have to enable that portfolio with communications and controls and still maintain the reliability and resiliency. So I, I think uh, that in 10 years, the importance of the grid is, more, is, is bigger than ever. Let me jump in uh, following on that as it touches uh, a little bit the area where uh, we're working at IBM Research, and it, that's on data and optimization models. Um, I believe that, and we've already heard it today, that we're moving from the old model where uh, supply follows demand and we can tweak supply such that we meet uh, the demand we need. We're now, we will be moving and we're already moving into the problem where supply is quite uncertain and we need to tweak demand and take advantage of the flexibility of demand to address the uncertainties in supply. And to do that, we certainly do need the grid. We do need the portfolio of renewables. Uh, that's my belief. Uh, we also need advanced models. Uh, naturally, I'm thinking of the uh, modeling and mathematical expertise uh, that is required here to address this problem so that we have um, the right distribution. And furthermore, I believe that we will be in a position where we would be using exogenous data to better address the demands of the customers. Uh, certainly, our, uh, the consumers will also be producers. Uh, but I'm of the belief uh, that uh, rather than consumers adapting to the energy system, the energy system has to adapt to the consumers. Um. Ten years from now, I think the whole energy era will be a more democratic one. Uh, the two fuels of the future, wind and sun, are locally available free of charge. Uh, that will 
give local control over pricing, uh, production, um, and indeed security of supply. It will require a different type of engagement with local communities, and the industry will not only have to earn economic goodwill, it will have to earn human goodwill by a diff very, very different type of democra uh, democratic engagement with communities. Uh, I would say that some of the European utilities of today won't exist 10 years from now. Uh, and there is a, uh, a classic uh, scenario in place that the electricity industry will undergo the same transformational change that happened to the telecommunications industry and the IT industry. And look what has happened to that over the last 10 years. And the successful utility of 10 years from now will be an energy services provider, uh, not a commodity supplier, which they are today. And the consumer and customer will be an active participant right across the electricity supply chain to enable the balancing of supply and demand. I would also say that the customer will have to be at the center of everything that the successful utility will do in the next five to 10 years, unlike today. And today, utilities don't have customers, they have billing points. And I think uh, Matthew described it as a negative dated relationship. And Scott used a term this morning in dealing with customers when he said, we must surprise and delight. 99% uh, of engagement which utilities have today with customers uh, is around two touch points, both negative. One is the restoration of a power outage, you know, in times of storm, etc. And the second one is when the dreaded bill arrives. So the utility industry, the successful utility industry, a decade from now, will be in the business of surprising and delighting. So thinking of that, okay, that's the what in a way, but I'm going to come back to some of those issues in a moment, but thinking of the, the when, because it's a very critical question, isn't it? If you're a, a company in this space right now that is trying to develop services, whether you're an incumbent or whether you're a new entrant or whether you're uh, uh, some company that's trying to actually change things dramatically, whether it's like Tesla or anyone else, timing is, is really critical, right? I mean, whether it's, if it's one year, two years, three years, five years, eight years, makes a huge difference. So when do we actually think this, these, this real change will start to, to materialize properly? We've seen in Australia that we're getting some change, but it's still relatively, relatively slow, right? It's still taking time, but it, as, when it pays off, it starts to, to accelerate. When do you think the timing will be on all of this? I, I think we're seeing it already. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're seeing the transformation of this industry before our very eyes. It's going to be slow for sure. You're going to get early adopters uh, who, who, who will do things, as Matthew Warren said earlier, regard, regardless of price. Um, but, but, but more and more as, uh, uh, as we engage and the customer becomes much more engaged with the system. Like the nature of the system, just by virtue of its design, has been passive. Uh, cu pa pa passive customers, and by and large, I don't disagree with Sean O'Driscoll, the customers have been taking what the utilities have been giving them, uh, and that's just the nature of the system. But utilities have to reinvent themselves and have to re reinvent uh, the industry and new players coming together comp with, with customers. So I think we're seeing it, at, I, I, I think we're actually seeing it as a, a, you know, before our very eyes. It, 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 I, I don't believe there's going to be a step change transformation overnight. There's this belief sometimes that you know, there is a single solution to this. There is no single solution to this. It's going to be a mix of solutions. It's going to take us a transition from where we are from the past to something very different in the future. It's going to maintain security of supply. It's going to deliver affordable electricity and at the same time clean electricity. I would agree. You know, the technologies are here, the quantum heater, Nest thermostats, Tesla batteries. They're, you know, the, the opportunity for the customer to participate in this portfolio of resources is there from a technology point of view. From a cost point of view, some of it has a ways to go, but where it has the longest ways to go is in the regulatory and market environment to enable participation of those resources. And th this is a big challenge, and it's one that lays on the shoulders of regulators 
I would say more than anyone else as we, as we define a new market structures. In Ireland, we're working on a package called DS3, delivering the secure and sustainable energy system, which is defining like 17 new services that we're gonna have a market for, related to flexibility and, and capacity and frequency regulation and, and, and all the things where customers could participate and get paid for those resources. And it, it is a matter of enabling those. And Dermot has a battery in his garage in California, but there's no payment for that. That's, that's in the category that Matthew described of people just wanting a cool thing in their garage. You know, the only, he's doing PG&E a favor and doing some balancing of his solar, but there's no economic reason to buy that battery now. But there could be when we, when we have this uh, package of, of resources that have value, you know, to, to the overall operation of the grid. So apart from regulation, what are the other catalysts of change here? I mean, what, what is going to really accelerate or decelerate this? I mean, is it going to be, uh, for example, trust in the industry, trust in the services? Is it going to be the, the speed at which battery technology develops? Is it, what, what do we think is, are there some key catalysts here that are going to change or that, that speed of adoption? Uh, this change is with us. Uh, the technology, as uh, Pat and Mark have said, is here, connectivity is here. The age of digital Dar Darwinism has arrived. Um, and there are huge disruptive forces you know, abroad out there. On the 25th of July, the afternoon of the 25th of July this year in Germany, 78% of all of the electricity consumed in the German system that day came from solar and wind. Very frequently at, win, uh, at weekends, 50% uh, of all the electricity on the system is coming from solar. Now, these are not just disruptive forces, uh, unsettling business models, E.ON, RWE were referred to today. They're shattered. Their business models are shattered. And the industry is going to have to look at things very, very differently. And the type of dislocation that has taken place, for example, in the German industry, is that the normal wholesale 24-hour forward pricing for a unit of electricity that's uh, traded on the wholesale market is in the mid-30 euros. For 100 hours last year in Germany, that pricing was negative. And at the most extreme negative, it was 1,800 euros. Now, there is huge, huge inherent value to be unlocked there. And that calls for new business models. And I know in you know, our group, we're participating in that. Earlier this year, we uh, invested in a new startup energy services business in Germany called BG, which stands for Better Energy. We took a 25% shareholding in that. And one of the 30% shareholder is the fifth largest electricity utility in Germany, uh, MVV. Major shareholder is the city of Mannheim. Five years ago, we would never have visualized ourselves getting into an investment like that. So it, the technologies are there, the disruptive forces are abroad. What it requires is creative minds to unlock new business opportunities. And it requires, again, the, the issue of regulation was, was uh, 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 spoken about earlier. If I look here in Ireland, regulation is not just about the Department of Energy, it's also about the Department of the Environment, who are responsible for building regulations. And we have to have a complete joint up approach to regulation rather than silo to regulation. These are the types of things that are required to create the industry of the future. Can I, can I bring yeah. you back to trust? Sure. Um, because I, I believe the industry here has a trusting relationship with its customers. And we have seen, particularly in the UK, where trust has been damaged between the energy industry, the regulatory and the political system, and, and, and consumers. And I think what's really, really important here that as we transition, that that trust is maintained. For sure, it's not perfect and more can be done. More can be done in terms of engagement, in terms of community engagement. But by and large, there, 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 there is trust by customers and by the public of, of the industry. So how we transition the whole question of affordability and the whole question of we move particularly to distributed energy resources. And I believe that distributed energy resources have a key role to play here. <clears throat> and, and prices are dropping like a stone. But if where, where subsidy collides with distributed energy resources and then collides with, I suppose, uh, you know, people who can and cannot afford to invest in these technologies. If we develop a system in the future 
where the people who can afford to play in this new future and get the benefit from it, they are the only people who benefit. And as we saw in some of the slides earlier, then that means that the fixed cost, the piece below, the iceberg below the, uh, you know, below the surface, the, that high fixed cost then is pick, picked up by fewer and fewer customers. So the fuel poor start paying more. We will lose trust dramatically. So I think it behoves all of us in the industry and policy and regulatory to, to actually make sure that we make this transition while maintaining and building on that trust. Okay, going back to the trust issue, right? I mean, when you look at telco, when we talk about telecom developments and, and some of the IT services that the customers have got into in a big way, that hasn't actually happened in the context of, a, of, an, of an industry where there's an awful lot of negative feeling because of media or because of whatever that's going on in that market. If you look at the UK, for example, the, 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 and Australia, of course, Australia's happening in a very negative environment. Uh, um, and uh, now the, the question is, I remember one uh, utility in, in Great Britain who once said that they, uh, as a new entrant, who said that they succeeded by demonizing uh, the, the major players. And, uh, and that was really their, their strategy. Now, the thing is that that may work when you're trying to win customers from a, from a utility on just for the energy itself. But when you're trying to build a level of trust, is there a risk that this negative image that's in the industry is going to work against us? Not only the incumbents, but also the, the, the new models that are coming through. Do you think there's a, a trust problem, even for guys like you for your, with your services? Um, you know, something the negative can always be turned around. Um, you know, think back in this country 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I don't think the telecommunications industry had, there was a positive attitude towards it. Uh, you know, in fact, it was a very negative attitude towards it. Um, today, electricity is a commodity. How do you turn that into services? You know, that is what it's all about. And of, and of course it can be turned around. I don't think some of the utilities, as I said earlier, that exist today will be around 10 years from now, so they won't necessarily be the people who will turn it around. But you will have new entrants. You will have the, the visionary existing utilities um, who will reconfigure their product offering, their service offering. They can turn it around. But I go further and say they will turn it around. But just, yeah, any other comments on that? I mean, just to be challenging on this, I mean, but if you look around at where we are so far, we heard with Matthew talking and others, the question is, I guess, we do see these snippets of success around the world, but we actually, as yet, um, haven't seen any, an awful lot of success from, from all these offerings. So it's still in the future, right? And we've talked about the, the catalyst to change that. But do you think maybe, it's, maybe we haven't quite found the golden egg yet? Do you think maybe that's partly it? You were talking about the creativity and... and well, look at Denmark. Yeah. Denmark is the standout country in the world when it comes to the whole area of renewable technology and a very, very positive community-based engagement with its energy sector and in particular the electricity sector. You know, and again, a negative image around you know, this industry at the moment is that it will increase the cost of electricity. And it, you know, it's, it's a barrier to economic progress. In the last 15 years, Denmark's consumption of energy has reduced by 20%, and its economy has grown by 50%. So they are complementary. And it has created some of the finest industries in the world in renewables, Vesta, wind turbines. So they, they took a social policy, uh, and they converted it into their economic advantage. But also they have the highest prices in Europe. Is that a concern? I think the people there are okay with that. They're okay, you know, that's a, true. That is trans, true. It's but would the Irish be thing. okay with that? And I, I think that that's part of the issue of, uh, of creating the trust. Uh, in New York, they have this initiative that they call reforming the energy vision. Yeah. And the thing that they're doing right there is involving all the stakeholders. So the consumer groups, the aggregators, the solar and wind providers, and the utilities, all trying to write the rules together and at least sitting at the table together. So, you know, get the arguments on the table in front of everyone and, and have some transparency in the way the rules are being created. And I see that as, as a reasonably successful approach to get at something where consumers can, can see that 
at least everyone's talking about the issues and, and where, where prices are going. I think uh, Arizona I think and California I, I, I are I think there's a dialogue to take place. Uh, and Sean and I were talking about this in the corridor earlier. Sean actually brought it up. That you, know, you couldn't have had this conference here today five years ago. Ireland wasn't ready for it. And I think it's incredible that we're having it here today. And what's needed is to join up all of the pieces and take a dialogue out to the people. I, for sure, the investment that's needed in new technologies is going to have to be rewarded and it's going to, it has the potential to be price increasing. Uh, but in conjunction with you know, different technologies deployed in different ways, energy efficiency, the price of electricity might actually go up, but the overall cost of electricity on an annual basis might actually come down. So we're not, but, but we're, we're not having that dialogue with, with, with customers. Uh, and uh, you know, so I, I think the leadership that's needed right throughout the industry and throughout policy is to, is to start engaging on that. And ask the, ask the country and ask customers and ask the public, what kind of an, an energy system do we want in the future? What are we prepared to pay for it? And what benefits do we see from it? And I think that's what you've seen in Germany, right? That's what we've seen in, 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 uh, even in the Netherlands to some extent, certainly in Denmark, where they have actually, that's it, in those markets where they've developed a lot, it's been a, everyone has accepted that they, they have to invest, they have to develop, there's going to be a, a cost yeah. And every, initially, at least. everybody benefiting. That yes. is absolutely key because the nature of electricity for 100 years it has been societal greater good and there has been socialization of parts of the cost of electricity right across all of, you know, all of the economy. So how everybody participates in the future and gains in the future is a key policy issue. So looking at the disruptions that are actually creating this need for new business models, uh, I can envision, uh, and it's already happening, uh, companies like... Uh, Airbnb or uh, in other industries where they offer the uh, platform for consumers to trade with each other in a deregulated manner um, and avoid uh, some of the restrictions that you might find from policymakers. And I think people that um, are looking out for such opportunities might actually take advantage of any mistrust that might exist to create uh, these models. And it won't take long before they are considered as the norm and then they come into play. We had one question over there. Is it, is it still okay to ask you? If we could have the microphone a second, just to, um, I just want to sort of, uh, and if anyone else has any questions, I will sort of, yeah, I'll sort of, in, sort of flow you in so that, uh, okay, yeah. Don Lobralacan. I've got loads now. Can you hear me? <laughs> Don, Don Lobralacan. Uh, my question is that would this transition that everybody is talking about be accelerated by a complete separation of generation from uh, the wires business uh, in this country in particular? In other words, complete separation uh, in ownership and uh, separate companies, not any of this management fiction we have with the transmission grid at the moment. And to what extent also would the kind of remunicipalization of the distribution grids, as has happened in Boulder, Colorado, and it was done after a popular vote in, in Hamburg, I believe, and I know Hamburg has uh, two million people, would that also help the, uh, to have more innovation uh, by, uh, let's say, larger, uh, more informed purchasers rather than individuals, high net worth individuals like the Tesla people we heard? I suppose that's a question that's directed at me, and uh, I, uh, I would say, and I would say this, that no, I don't believe the separation uh, of, of the value chain along the, way, along the lines that uh, you, you, you mentioned necessarily improves anything. I don't believe the configuration or the ownership uh, in the market today has hindered in any way the progress that has been made. Ireland has made huge progress. I can see you shaking your head. But uh, Ireland has made huge progress. We have one of the most competitive retail markets in Europe. We have the greatest amount of churn, next only to Great Britain. Uh, so that is some achievement for a small market of about 2.2 million uh, customers. And we must look at the uniqueness of Ireland and the scale of Ireland. We have six times more electricity network than, than the average in, 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 in Great Britain. So, so, you know, there, there are structural issues around Ireland, and what we need to do is cut the cloth to suit the measure. I believe we have a structure that works, and will that structure remain like that for all time? It's likely to change and evolve, and that's what it's doing as we speak. Yeah, and if, and if, we, if we have just a market for kilowatt hours, just an energy market, then, you know, that's, that's going to, whatever we do with the structure isn't going to matter because we're not rewarding the flexibility services and the capacity services that we need to make this whole portfolio work. And so regardless of how you structure things, 
we need to create incentives, markets, some form of um, rules for contracts to get these services from all the resources that are out there. And those, those resources determine the viability of conventional power plants as well. It's, you know, energy markets don't determine whether they survive or not. Other markets determine it when we get in this new world. I would say the transformation, in fact, would be achieved much, much easier and quicker if it was a more consolidated industry. Because if you're, if you're trying to bring around change and you're dealing with three, four parties, it's far, far more difficult than if you were dealing with one single uh, party. Uh, so I, 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 think that I think the whole fragmentation of the industry and the, uh, the deregulation of the industry uh, has actually made the transformation uh, incredibly more complex and difficult to achieve. And we see that ourselves. Sometimes when you go to certain markets where they don't have, uh, I mean, you go somewhere like Korea, for example, <laughs> It's an awful lot easier to implement smart grid when you're, you're still integrated in that, in that sense. But yeah. I would say what you said, I mean, there are other markets, of course, and other places that have, where they've bought back the grid. And in Germany itself, there was another town recently that, that did the same. Um, but I think, it, from at least what I've seen, the question, the question would then be, in those places where they've taken back the grid, has that led to any better services or has it led to any better life for the, for the customers themselves? At least I haven't seen it. There, there are examples in the U.S. especially where municipals and co-ops can innovate mm. a lot easier than regulated utilities. They don't have a regulator to, to approve things. They have a board, and if they want to do something for the good of their town, like put in fiber to every home, which is happening in Ireland as well, but in Chattanooga, Tennessee, they just decided to do it. Mm. And it cost money but it ended up being a very good investment. So then we're going back to regulation. So the question there would be, do you think that regulation in this dynamic future, when we don't even know what the services are in the future, we don't actually know, from a regulator's point of view, it's difficult, right? How do you regulate something if no one even knows what it's gonna be? Is that, is, does, it, does the regulation then need to be responsive in that sense? It needs to be reactive um, to those changes. It needs to be fast also, yeah, fast. You know, because things are yeah. changing very quickly and that's, you know, you can only talk about things so long and then there has to be trust yeah. that, that we're all out for, you know, for the good and, and to try things. Yeah. Um, those, those, look, there's about two and a half thousand municipalities in Europe. These are integrated distribution and supply companies where they haven't disaggregated retail from distribution. And for sure, it, it, it becomes city or town policy then to do certain things along the value chain and it becomes much, much easier to do that. Uh, we, we, we have a different model here in Ireland and you know, the rest of Europe has a different model as well. It's moving towards disaggregation or breakup of the value chain. I, I don't believe that regulation end to end is, is the answer. I think what we need to do is to find sensible regulation for that piece that makes sense. Regulation then will look after the societal greater good and we need to create the dynamic where markets and technology can come together uh, to provide the mechanisms where the customer then becomes the pull on the whole system. Yep. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Brendan Halligan, the <coughs> chairman of the Institute. A question to the, to, to the panel as a whole. What advice would you give to Minister Alex, Alex White in writing the White Paper in respect of its strategic thrust and is energy too narrow a focus for the white paper? Um, I, I, I suppose um, en energy is all pervasive and you know, energy touches every part of society. And when you look at it through the stovepipe of an energy white paper, you miss that for sure. Um, I, I, I suppose there's something interesting too, if I speak for the electricity industry, the electricity industry is about 20% of the uh, usage of total energy in Ireland and policy and regulation around decarbonisation is focused on the 20% of the problem, but there's an 80% of the problem, which is, which is transport and heat. You throw agriculture into that, it's even bigger. And so th th that's part of the broad sweep around climate change that has to come together. The advice I would give uh, Alex White, Minister Alex White, is that um, you know, we need to be careful that we don't set an expectation that a white paper is prescriptive, it can never be prescriptive, uh, that he has to find some way of creating the framework and the environment where the kind of changes that we are talking about can take place. And I suppose specifically, he needs to be very careful to make sure that policies do not self-select the technologies to leave 
the framework and the policy for the, for the technologies to come through without uh, doing things that preordain the technology choices. Keep it flexible. I'll ask one question in a moment. Just one, yeah, did you want to say something? Just one question. How big a game changer is, is storage in all of this? Thinking for us, we hear a lot about people saying that storage is the game changer. Is it? What do you think? Or is data? Storage, uh, data, yeah. Wait. I think it's a catalyst in the yeah. change uh, that is taking place. I once heard uh, a utility company say that they're one storage solution away from bankruptcy. Um, again, it's, what, uh, it's the change that I mentioned at the beginning. Rather than supply following demand, demand follows supply, and storage makes that uh, an option. Um, what I like is about it? storage is it's, it's really the poster child for everything we're talking about. You know, it, it involves all of the controversy and energy versus capacity and services. Who owns it? Does it? Is it customer? Is it on the grid? You know, all of those questions that we have to answer, we have to answer about storage. Yeah. With storage, we have time. It's still way too expensive. So, you know, even, even as, as inexpensive as, as a, a $3,000 Tesla battery is for your garage, you know, it's actually, there's no market for anything to pay for that $3,000, so hopefully it does look really nice. But it, <laughs> it, uh, it, it provides a lot of services yeah. that have more and more value the more renewables we put on the system. So realizing that we have to pay for that, that flexibility, but the more renewables we put on the system, the more value storage has. And then we have to answer the questions of, of how we're going to allow it to be on the system. Personally, I think residential energy storage is the winner. Yeah. That gets all the value streams that a 20 megawatt battery on the transmission system has and reliability and local distribution benefits, which the other ones don't have. Uh, storage is fundamental to the um, flexibility that's going to have to be built into the grid and distribution system of the future. Uh, like without question, it's that, that, that question, the answer to that is over. Um, I, I agree with Mark, uh, residential storage will be the winner. And you know, our group is in that sector. We are in residential thermal heat uh, for space heating and water heating. And 36% of all primary energy consumed in the OECD is consumed to provide heating, space heating, air conditioning and hot water. We all require sanitary hot water, you know, uh, 24 hours a day, 365. That is a very flexible residential store. It's a thermal store. It's not a two-way store. But you're, you're decoupling the generation from the consumption of the energy. And for five, six months of the year, in a lot of the European countries, we require space heating. And again, that can be stored in a thermal store. Those technologies have existed for the last 40 years. The downside to them in today's world is they're inflexible. The connectivity is now there. And the type of technology we have, for example, can take a frequency request from a network operator in 30 milliseconds. It can be switched on or switched off. And I, I agree with Mark, residential, whether it's our technology, residential, battery technology, that's going to win out in this industry in the next 10 to 15 years. So, yeah, I, um, I think storage, you know, we, we, the electricity has had storage um, it, probably since the dawn of time through hydro pump storage. It is limited and it's expensive. The storage we're talking about, particularly at the distributed end, right out at the end, you and, and consumer. Battery, particularly, Sean talks about heat. I think for, for the electrification of heat, through the storage of heat, as you start to profile and shift demand, then you get you get different price characteristics over the course of the day. The storage heating has traditionally suffered because it doesn't store, if it hasn't stored efficiently, and it can't be boosted cheaply during the day. That is changing with wind generation. So I think you could potentially see much more electrical storage heating. I think battery storage is definitely a game changer if you get the price point down to a point that is competitive. But it's the coexistence of battery storage with solar PV, with technology then it integrates those. So I could have a solar panel on my roof and my neighbor could be the battery that I'm storing it. And an energy company then is 
kind of pulling all that together and making it all work in a way that is efficient and cost effective. So when we're talking about timing and we're talking about when this is all going to succeed and how it's going to succeed, is it, do you think then, that, that what we're saying and what you're saying, that we need all these things to come to play at the same time? It's like the stars in a way. When everything is sort of in place, then it all makes sense. I mean, do you think it's going to be a sort of a case where we get to a point where things come together and then suddenly I, things I, change? I don't think it's all going to fall into place neatly. There's kind of no monopoly and wisdom in this. Uh, there'll be mistakes made, there'll be things that will, you know, will not quite fit together. Um, and I, I think, you know, what we're seeing is um, that you're putting the customer much more in control. You're going to get the customer beginning to plug and play with components. The, 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 the components, they don't quite plug and play. I think over time it's going to evolve to something very different. Uh, Tony Walsh, uh, ESP Networks. Uh, the panel actually started to discuss the point I was going to make, which is generally that um, everybody's been looking at how much electricity has been generated, what's the grid being used for. But the other side of it is the whole decarbonisation also refers to can you electrify heat and can you uh, electrify transport. If you put in, if a typical ESB customer, domestic customer, would use around 5,500 kilowatt hours a year and have a demand of 2 kilowatts, a, an electric car will take 3,500 kilowatt hours and have a 3 kilowatt demand, 50% higher than a normal ESP customer. 25% of all new houses built last year all had heat pumps in them, which you have a demand of about 1.5 kilowatts and use around 1,000 kilowatt hours. The costs of running a grid are all fixed, so if you increase the throughput, you just get better value and you get the same income or even a higher income from spreading your, your, your costs over a larger volume. Uh, so I think that aspect needs to be looked at. I think there are some impediments to that uh, at the moment coming from the EU, such as that the uh, putting in direct heat, electric heating doesn't seem to meet some of the EU um, uh, criteria, even though much of the heat is going to come from wind. Um, but obviously, if you have a larger electric load, you can accommodate a lot more renewables a lot more easily and you can actually have a virtuous circle. So maybe the panel would like to comment on some of those points. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, part of the answer to that is a technical one that passes his colleagues would understand a little better than me. And it goes back to uh, something that's called the primary energy factor. And the primary energy factor determines uh, you know, what, what can and cannot be put into a, a new build environment. And primary energy factors are historical and they're based around what the composition of electricity generation was 15, 20 years ago. There has been massive, massive decarbonisation of the electricity industry across Europe. We need forward-looking primary energy factor. What will the industry look like? What will the composition of generation be? 10 years from now, 20 years from now. When you're putting in heating systems into new buildings, that is an investment for 20 years. You know, and that needs, that system should be determined by what the generation of electricity will be over that forward looking period, not over the historic looking period where a lot of it came from coal generated electricity. Just on that, I don't know if Owen Wilson is here, he's Chief Executive of the Electricity Association of Ireland. When he headed up your Electrics Environmental Committee, he made a lifelong campaign of this in the EU. And it's exactly as Sean says, we need a change in the EU to the primary energy factor for electricity, which then makes electricity, de as, it be as it becomes more and more decarbonized, comparable to gas uh, in, in, in terms of space heating in buildings. I, I think Tony, in a way, you might have answered your, your, your question, but the one, the one Thing that we're, what I think about this is that um, if, if we continue just with, with electricity as our focus and more and more of these new technologies come on the system and customers start to go off-grid or degrees of off-grid, even the 50-50 that Matthew Warren spoke about, the cost of the grid is going to go up for everybody and particularly those who rely on the grid 100% of the time. So one way of optimizing or leveraging the investment that's already made in the system, in the grid, coupled with decarbonization of the generation side, 
then is to move to the, the, the electrification of transport and heat. Um, Sean's own company has invested significantly in technologies around improving heat, heat pumps and storage and, and, and storage heating and direct heating. Uh, vehicle technology and battery technology still has a bit to go. People, even if it takes 20 minutes uh, on a motorway station to charge your battery 80% of the time, to 80%, don't pick you want to wait to 20 minutes. But battery technology for vehicles is going to change over time. And for sure, electric vehicles have a role to play in cities. So I think to, to keep the costs down on this trajectory to the future, we need to look at the, at the electrification of transport and heat, while at the same time then drive the decarbonisation of the electricity system. So uh, moving on to uh, subsidies. I can't sort of not talk about subsidies at all, because there's a big issue here. Two things in a way, subsidies and who's going to be included in all of this future going forward. Um, first of all, just a very blank question, do we, need, do we need subsidies and how do we need subsidies? What should be the role of subsidies going forward? Maybe from a sort of non-European perspective. Uh, I, I think um, from a US perspective where you know, we like to use this thing called net metering as our hidden subsidy for, you know, for distributed generation period, but especially solar, I think that transparency of subsidies to me is the most important thing that people understand what the subsidies are i think a lot of society is on board with subsidies that moves us in a direction of, of decarbonization but hidden subsidies and and subsidies that you know transfer costs from one part of the you know customer to another category of customer um, are, are very difficult you know in Arizona, we implemented a new rate structure that has a demand charge. It still is net metering, but it's net metering with a demand charge, which is actually a lot more fair in terms of the impact on, on all the customers, the rate base. And, it, and do you feel that, do the, do the customers understand that? Do the customers, well, you feel they, they understand it? Well, they understand it, you know, but they have to listen to a lot of publicity from a lot of different stakeholders in terms of, you know, the evil utility and and that kind of thing. But the, uh, in, in the end, customers are, are pretty knowledgeable. They, they figure things out and, and, uh, and are on board with things like that. And, and things like that, that reduce the subsidy for solar, only move the penetration of solar out in time a little bit. You know, it's happening. We're at, we're at a tipping point in solar. There's no question about that. A lot of, you know, the speakers have talked about that. It's it's economic on a kilowatt hour basis. We shouldn't be talking about levelized cost of energy really though, but regardless, it is, uh, it is, it is becoming less and less expensive and, and uh, it will happen and how we accommodate that and how we, how we deal with that but is I, very important. I, I guess what I'm getting at is that if you look at Germany, one of the reasons why Germany subsidized so heavily, and they said it themselves, you know, which is that uh, at the time that they were subsidizing very, very heavily, they didn't really have much experience. They didn't know what, was the, the, the be, what were the best solutions, what was the best way forward. They subsidized everything to give everything a little bit of a chance until they knew what was really the best way forward, and now they're kind of more letting them go their own way, increasing or planning to. And, and we're doing um, that with energy storage, we're yeah. doing that with electric transportation, and those, yeah. are, those are societal goals. And as long as it's transparent and people are on board, it's a good thing. But what is, yeah, I, sorry. I, I, I think Germany did something in subsidies that there'd be a revolt here in this country if it was done. Yeah. So what, Ger what Germany effectively did with subsidy was it lumped all the subsidy uh, for renewable and new technologies onto the domestic customer. So it yeah. didn't burden industry. Uh, mm. uh, it, so, and, and obviously the, the domestic customer in Germany is prepared yeah. to tolerate that 35 or whatever it is, euros a, a, a cents a kilowatt hour. But I, I think subsidies have a role to play. If I speak from an industry perspective, um, I don't think it's in the interest of the industry long term to be an industry based on subsidy. Uh, so I think subsidies, the role that subsidies have to play is to incubate and to support R&D. So a, a point has to come where renewable technologies do not require a subsidy. Um, and, 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 but then other technologies, while they're going through the evolution phase, will need subsidies. I think the danger with subsidies, uh, particularly if you take the subsidies we've had in the system today, and in Ireland, we have exposed explicitly the subsidies, a line item on your bill, um, so customers know what the subsidy is. Um, 
so while you're building grid scale renewable generation like, wind, like large wind farms, that's subsidy socialized across all of the customer base. But as you go towards more distributed forms of generation, then the subsidy then that's socialized across everybody goes to people then who can afford to invest in new technologies. I think that's something that we need to think very carefully about and have an open and honest debate about. Yes, I mean, I mean, I mean just first of all, I mean, I, I guess the thing is, because what I'm, I'm getting at them is also that this issue of, uh, um, as we've heard before, there's a t you know, things are getting more and more competitive and, and there will be a time when certain offerings will, will be attractive to consumers and they become attractive consumers. Is it worth paying big subsidies to support a mass rollout of things in a sense or trying to push a mass rollout of something before it's ready? Or is that just throwing money down the drain? I mean, I guess that's the, in a way the question. Yeah. Or is the idea of subsidy to just, as you said, incubate things uh, help them to, to the technology to grow until, you know, to actually have a chance. I can address that from the perspective of a consumer yeah. and also an R&D um, uh, institution. Subsidies are always good to get someone who is skeptical to get on a solution. Mm. Uh, so as an initial, initial uh, incentive, yes, they can work. However, they have the negative of expecting that subsidy for years to come, and that can lead to a lack of competition and a lack of positive results. And I can say the same for uh, R&D. Uh, while they're needed to start, to jumpstart something, uh, a prolonged uh, time of uh, subsidies can then lead to negative. So it actually, in a way, encourages the, the development of the less competitive yes. technologies, exactly. and you should have a more and, of it. Yes, create some type of complacency. Good, okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, you're at the back, yes, yeah, so on the shirt. Grant and Healy again. Hello. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, this subsidy question is a little thorny. Um, I'm sure. Of, That's why I asked it. I used, to work in the European, <laughs> I used to work in the European Parliament, and we had this conversation in the 90s when we started talking about the Renewables Directive, and it's the same old broken record, I'm afraid. And the lady is correct. Subsidies, people get stuck on subsidies. But I'm talking here about the fossil fuel subsidies mm. of 500 billion a year, plus the nuclear subsidies, which are never talked about, including in Finland, of course, where you have a civil liability guarantee, which is given for free and is effectively a trillion dollar insurance that's not paid for. And if you also include the external costs, we're talking trillions of dollars of support for fossil mm. and nuclear. So please, let's talk about all of the subsidies. And if we're going to make it transparent, can we make all of those subsidies transparent, please? So that at least consumers can then see how much tax money is being spent on subsidy-supporting fossils, how much external costs are not being included in the cost of running these industries, how much the civil liability guarantee is worth. And then let's talk about subsidies. And in terms of the subsidies not encouraging improvement, the German support scheme was digressive, became digressive over years. It started, if I remember correctly, at 99 Fennig for solar which is about 40 euro cent or something, and gradually was decreased every year as the, because it reflected the improvement in the, in the cost. And that is what drove the cost down, which is why we're benefiting from solar today. So you can have a support scheme, which is a subsidy, let's call it, which has the effect of making the products more efficient, which is now what we're benefiting from. So I think just to say subsidy equals bad news, but you, yeah. So I Thank mean, you. good points. I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, because what we're saying is, then you should. I mean, you're totally correct. I mean, I'm I'm based in Helsinki, and uh, I've never supported nuclear for, for sure. Um, but uh, but the but the reality is that. Um, uh, but the question is here is about are we using subsidies in the right way? Subsidies are a a finite resource, they're a scarce resource, and we have to use them. And in a sense, I guess what's happened in the past shouldn't reflect more mistakes of the future. But I mean, what, how should they, they be? I mean, I guess that's the question. Any more comments on, uh, on a that? Sub, a subsidy should be a catalyst, yeah. not a life support. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. it's a stimulant to you know, get an industry going or to get a technology yeah, going, good. but it has to have a finite life. You cannot build a sustainable business on long-term subsidies. Yeah. Good. Any more? Yeah, one more question there. Sorry then, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ian Lumley uh, from Antarctica, and it's a very much ESB question, our, our co-hosts here. Uh, we've heard much today about this concept of energy citizen and the collapse of the old-time relationship between the customer and the power generator and, um, and grid transmitter. 
Um, there's a major impediment in Ireland, uh, which is not the case in other European countries, whereby a micro generator, whether it's residential or a small business commercial operator, um, is not able, because of the current Irish regulatory regime, to be able to sell surplus microgeneration into the local distribution grid. It's only for the big investment boys can, can do that. So the question is, when is ESB Networks going to lift that barrier and follow you know, European practice in allowing surplus microgeneration to be sold into the grid? It's, it's, it's not an ESP networks restriction. Uh, like, it, it, technically, the networks can allow uh, power to flow in any direction. It, it's more a market, a regulatory, and a policy. Uh, we, we did have ESP, it was then ESP customer supply, it's now Electric Ireland, had an arrangement for a fixed period of time where we gave a tariff, where, where, where at, at a cost to ESB, we gave a tariff to promote the kind of thing you're talking about. But, but ultimately, that all has to stack up in the context of the economics. If I give you an example from Portugal, um, it, it, and, and it's based on their, their learning from Germany, where a, a, a tariff, a very, very attractive solar tariff, started to, to, to dump. Uh, people were, were putting solar panels on their roofs for more than their own need and taking the commercial opportunity of exporting it. That drove quite a lot of uh, requ requirement for investment in the local grid that had to be socialized across everybody. And they got, people got a tariff for that. So in, in Portugal, what they do now is they use, they look at microgeneration as in the same way as they look at energy efficiency. So you invest in microgeneration to make your own uh, situation more efficient. And to the extent that you want to export that, you take your chances on the export price. Uh, and so I suppose we're talking about markets, we're talking about subsidies. So, there isn't a bottomless pit where, where, um, where, 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 of resource where people can be paid more than the market values their export. Uh, and I, I think that's again a debate that ha it, it, it's kind of, it's a, it's a harsh sounding position, but that actually is the reality. And I, and I suppose what we need is, we need the regime in place to encourage microgeneration, uh, and, and that microgeneration in all its forms is seen then as a way of making people much more energy sustainable to the extent then that they want to export it, the system and the regular regime and the market should allow it, but it should be at a market price with a market value. Imaro yeah. Shakru, um, FASTA and EOS Future Design. I want to uh, not talk about subsidies, but I want to talk about a carbon price and a distribution of that value to everybody equally. That is a proposal being made in Paris shortly by FASTA. The reason why that is better than subsidies and, and refits and so on is that a lot of the sort of narrow thinking that would in, inform the panel indeed to support uh, electricity for heating comes from the fact that you're not really considering carbon and you're not looking at the other utilities of water and waste that that um, uh, as, because it all really comes in a package that if you were to consider water and waste and carbon implications of those you would definitely plump for distributed energy generation with distributed heat you'd be looking at bioenergy certainly for backup for that critical backup because it would also do your waste treatment, it would also manage your uh, municipal waste. So what I'm telling you is, to a certain extent, I think you're too focused on electricity and energy. You've got to think broader. The world is short of every resource, but the most critical one is carbon. And a carbon price, particularly if that price, those receipts, is given equally to everybody as a basis of a citizen's income, is the way to have a proper level playing field. Yep. Um, I agree with you completely in relation to carbon price. I think the confusion in EU policy uh, since the 2020 pa uh, 20 package was put in place was they had multiple instruments to drive decarbonisation and you had those multiple in instruments interacting. You had the ETS or the carbon price and you had uh, re renewable targets. So uh, the I, I would support a carbon price being the driver of decarbonisation, absolutely. Because if you get, uh, uh, but the ETS hasn't got to that point yet, and there's a lot of deliberations going on in the EU Commission about that. Now, the second point you make about, about waste, 
and energy and waste to energy. That's all part of distributed energy resources. And I think the future is moving towards more, more distributed energy resources. Uh, biomass, bioenergy, it makes sense that you know, biomass is burnt um, where, where, where it is collected in small scale or medium scale power plants at the level of maybe a town or a municipality. Uh, the same waste to energy, it's, it's all in the mix. Uh, and I think that they, are, they, are, they are all technologies of the future that, that will coexist with other technologies that will make up the future of the electricity system. Good, I think we're kind of short. Just one last question here, because we're very short on time now. Yep. Then we'll wrap up. Uh, hello, uh, Eamon, Eamon Connolly from Climate. Uh, question for the panel. Um, particularly with the, the comment about residential storage will win out, um, the logic of that is that it requires uh, some new technology to be in volumes, many, many thousands of customers' houses. Does the, how does the panel see um, how that technology would be deployed in volume? And do the traditional industry have the consumer marketing skills to implement it successfully? Question. And I would give Apple as the example of how to do it properly uh, in terms of consumer deployment of technology. I mean, I, I, would, I would add to that. I mean, do we, do we think that this, the industry needs to bring in more, more sort of skill into the industry? I mean, it, it is a challenge, but I, I guess also that who else is like Apple, right? There's only Apple, really. Is there anyone else that's done what Apple's done? So uh, you could argue that that's they're, they're a lone dog on that, but uh, yeah, any, any, yeah. Okay. I'll, give, I'll give a view, yeah. I, I think um, as we move to this more customer-centric, uh, um, world that utilities, utilities like ESB, are going to have to develop the marketing skills and the customer centric skills that haven't been a feature of our industry in the past. They didn't have to be a feature of our industry. And for example, in Electric Ireland, we're doing a lot in terms of marketing, in terms of engagement with customers. We're doing a lot in terms of innovation in supporting your, 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 your own business climate. We're in a collaboration with Google and Nest. We're in a collaboration with Hewlett Packard, where we, we, we've had a lifelong association with Glen Dimplex through heating and water controls, and we're doing customer trials in all of that. And I, I think the utility that doesn't embrace that then won't be a player. Uh, it, you know, it'll be a background player. It won't be a foreground or a front of house player in this new world. I, I would say that everything's there to, uh, we don't need new marketing approaches. Tesla knows how to market, Nest knows how to, how to market, you guys know how to market technologies. We just need to create the value streams and the utility has to create the infrastructure to link that residential resource to the DS3 services that are being developed here, here in Ireland. That, that connection, and there's a project right here in Ireland that, that's a, the center of a project for of Europe called Real Value that's doing exactly that. Projects like that create the infrastructure along with the market so the value streams are there. It will just happen. In Arizona, it's happening. If there's a demand charge at the residential customer level, People will buy home energy management systems, they will buy climate systems, they will buy nest systems, they will buy batteries to manage their demand because it will be sold at, at Walmart and Home Depot and everything else. It will just be standard products that they buy. It, it, it just happens if the value streams are there. Yeah, um, Mark has just touched on a project that we're leading here in Ireland um, called Real Value. And this is a consortium of 12 uh, pan-European, some from the utility industry, um, uh, some in the whole area of consumer behavior. But it is looking, all, all of the technologies exist, and it is how do you monetize those technologies when you bring it all together on an, aggregation, on an aggregated basis. So the, it's, it's around uh, installing the technology, whether it's the hardware, the connectivity, uh, the responsiveness to demand-side management enabling, uh, and it's, it is going to be structured around uh, 1,250 homes. 850 of those are here on the island of Ireland. Some of them are in the United Kingdom, some in Germany, and some in Latvia. So the technology, as I said, exists. The, the two, two key items that that project is striving to unlock is number one, 
what are the value streams that can be converted into business models. And the second one is the whole area of consumer behavior and engagement with the consumer. They, they are the two primary objectives of it. Last comment from Eleni. So, as a consumer, I envision that in the future I will be taking my phone uh, right before leaving from work and saying home, or I might even call it Watson. Um, I'll be leaving for home. Please make sure the house is uh, warm. Oh, and by the way, I have guests coming tonight for a swim. Please make sure the pool is heated. I don't have a pool, but uh, <laughs> just wake up. If I need extra energy, please check with my parents. They might have some spare to give me, uh, or get on the grid. Uh, if it's above this price, don't go for it. So I envision this interaction through um, uh, uh, technologies like we've, what we've seen today uh, and many more. I believe on their own they exist. As a whole, there's still work to do, but it's very doable. And um, as citizens, I would say that uh, what I mentioned, I started at the beginning saying um, in the past, cit citizens adapted to the city. In the future, the city adapts to the citizens. I think the same for energy. So Interesting. We're becoming very sophisticated as customers. Interesting point to wrap up. Just to wrap up then, thank you very much. Just to say that then trust, residential storage, flexible regulation, and certainly correct uh, facilitating regulation flexibility from the industry to respond to the changes, a focus on community and certainly a focus on consumers and consumer behavior, extreme creativity from the industry or from the new entrants in that industry, and, um, and unlocking the value so that we can pass it on to the customer because if there's a value, there will be a, a desire for it and uh, basically then put it in the oven, let it rise and, and eat it. So I think there's a lot of potential here and I think that there's a lot of barriers as well, but uh, hopefully we're, we're getting closer. So thank you to the panel and uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you.